Welcome to Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. This week, our focus is on the United Nations as it turns 76 this year. And this year's theme is creating a blueprint for a better future. The theme for UN Day Nigeria is building resilience through hope to recover from COVID-19, rebuild sustainably and respond to the needs of the planet. We'll be learning a bit more about the UN in a bit. First, a quick check and other discussions in diplomatic circles. The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SARAP, says the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is set to seek authorization from the pre-trial chamber of the court to open an investigation into cases of abduction of school children in several parts of northern Nigeria. The prosecutor also seeks to investigate the closure of schools and the persistent failure of Nigerian authorities at both the federal and state levels to end the abductions. SARAP's deputy director, Kala Wale Oluwadare says the ICC prosecutor's decision followed a petition sent to the court by SARAP. SARAP had in the petition dated September 4, 2021, urged the ICC prosecutor Karim Khan to push for those suspected to be responsible and complicit in the commission of these serious crimes to be invited and tried by the ICC. Former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger says no nation is built to dominate the whole world. He made the comment at the opening ceremony of the 2021 Bond Summit in Shanghai, China. He said former U.S. President Richard Nixon insisted that China could not be excluded from the international system. He also said that with China playing a more important role in the global stage now, leaders from China and the United States should further strengthen dialogue. When President Nixon came into office, the world was divided by very intense rivalries. There was a very intense debate in the United States about whether relations with China should be resumed at all, or whether China was so closely linked to the Soviet Union that it was part of the same problem. And I had the privilege as an American Secretary of State and then as a private citizen to participate in many programs on joint economic concerns, joint political concerns. And the emphasis was to see what common problems faced us and in which way each nation could contribute to it. <clears throat> the danger of a purely national approach and of a denial of equality of treatment to all nations. The danger is that when a crisis develops, it may be viewed from an entirely parcel and local perspective that the danger of confrontations will constantly mount because each issue becomes a matter of prestige and of demonstrating the dominance of one side over the other. Because it is not possible for any nation in the present world to achieve hegemony. What is possible is for each nation to develop to the maximum degree its potential. But no nation has the potential to dominate it, the whole world. Poland's Prime Minister Matthias Morawiecki says his country has no problems with the rule of law, adding that some European Union countries do not understand the country's judicial reforms. During a news conference in Brussels after a European Council summit where Poland's adherence to rule of law was discussed, Morawiecki added that the European Union has large competences but these were not boundless and that the bloc could only function within those assigned competences. Long-running tensions between Poland's ruling nationalist and the bloc's liberal majority have spiked since Poland's constitutional tribunal ruled this month that elements of EU law were incompatible with the country's charter, challenging a central tenet of EU integration. World leaders have condemned the coup in Sudan in which the Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok and four other civilian officials are being held in detention by some soldiers. The head of Sudan's Sovereign Council, General Abdul Fattah Abdul Rahman Burhan, has announced a state of emergency in the country and dissolved the Sovereign Council that was overseeing the transition to civilian rule and has dissolved the cabinet. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres commented on the situation on social media, saying, quote, I condemn the ongoing military coup in Sudan 
Prime Minister Hamdok and all other officials must be released immediately. There must be full respect for the Constitutional Charter to protect the hard-won political transition. The UN will continue to stand with the people of Sudan. End of quote. The UK's Minister for Africa, Vicky Ford, called the coup a betrayal of the Sudanese people and their democratic transition. She called on security forces to release Prime Minister Hamdok and other civilian leaders and those who do not respect right to protest without fear of violence will be held to account. The African Union says it is dismayed about events in Sudan and has called for the immediate resumption of dialogue between the military and civilians. The US is also deeply alarmed by the news of the coup, saying it contravenes the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people. The Arab League says it is concerned for Sudan's transition to civilian rule. Finally, the European Union's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, called for stakeholders and regional partners to put the process back on track. In the meantime, pro-democracy protesters have taken to the streets of the capital, Khartoum, with 12 people said to have been injured in clashes between protesters and the military forces. Sunday, October 24th was the United Nations Day, an annual commemorative day reflecting the official creation of the United Nations on October 24, 1945. This year, the UN turned 76. Indeed, it's been 76 years of the United Nations born out of the League of Nations, which began in 1919 with 48 countries. World War II was an eye-opener to the fact that a stronger union was needed following the devastation of cities, a millions of people dead from the war, art and culture stolen or lost, and atrocities that violated basic human rights that shook the world. The United Nations arose from the chaos and was developed as a place where the world's nations could gather, discuss common problems, and find shared resolutions with peacekeeping as the priority. Today, the UN's 193 members, including the United States, are bound by the UN Charter with goals to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, establish conditions on international justice, and promote social progress and better standards of life. It tries to fulfill these goals through its several agencies, some of which are the International Labour Organization, the World Health Organization, the Children's Fund, UNICEF, the World Food Programme, and the Refugee Agency, better known as the UNHCR, among others. While the United Nations has been hailed as a great organization, it is not without its challenges, and that's because, as you will agree, today's issues are complex. Climate change continues to be a hot-button topic, and as the UN calls world leaders to commit re to reducing greenhouse gases to save our planet, a COVID-19 pandemic has reduced populations and devastated economies. It still threatens global health as vaccine distribution is yet to meet its targets. Conflicts, hunger and displacement cannot be ignored. However, as the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, would tell you, the UN remains the only organization in a better position to effect change on a global scale. 76 years ago, the United Nations was created as a vehicle of hope for a world emerging from the shadow of a catastrophic conflict. Today, the women and men of the UN carry this hope forward around the globe. COVID-19, conflicts, hunger, poverty, and the climate emergency remind us that our world is far from perfect. But they also make clear that solidarity is the only way forward. We need to come together to tackle great challenges and advance the Sustainable Development Goals. By ensuring that every person, everywhere, has access to COVID-19 vaccines sooner rather than later. By securing and upholding the rights and dignity of all people, especially the poorest and most disadvantaged girls and women and children and young people, by seeking an end to the conflicts that scar our world, by making bold climate commitments to save our planet and living up to them, and by building global governance that is more inclusive, networked and effective, as detailed in my recent report, Our Common Agenda. The values that have powered the UN Charter for the last 76 years Peace, development, human rights, and opportunity for all have no expiry date. As we mark UN Day, let's unite behind these ideals and live up to the full promise, potential, and hope of the United Nations.
Joining me now is the UNICEF representative in Nigeria, Peter Hawkins. Before his appointment to Nigeria in May 2019, Mr. Hawkins was UNICEF representative in Iraq between September 2015 and April 2019. Prior to that, he worked with the UK's Department for International Development and International Charities Save the Children. He joins me now from our studio in Abuja. Peter Hawkins, thank you for joining me on the program today. 76 years of the United Nations, what would you say is behind the global organization's longevity despite changing global challenges? As you've said, it's 76 years, 1945, since the creation of the United Nations. I think its longevity is, is about how it's been able to adapt. It's been able to adapt based on four principles, human rights, peace, development, and uh, adapt, uh, 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 helping people to uh, seek their own opportunities. And it's that opportunity that has allowed the United Nations to shift a little bit, to understand better what people want to do and how it can take that uh, agenda forward. I think secondly is also, we, we used to have the MDGs, um, and then now we have the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this was developed in natural fact mainly uh, through uh, the, the office of the Deputy Secretary General and Amina Mohammed herself was uh, one of the main co-authors of the uh, SDGs uh, and that has allowed the UN to adapt and to move forward with its developmental agenda. The theme for the day, the UN Day that is here in Nigeria, is building resilience through hope to recover from COVID-19, rebuild sustainably and respond to the needs of the planet. Could you unpack that for our viewers? What, what it's trying to do, I mean, COVID-19 is, is not over yet, but here in Nigeria, it's not only respond to the outbreak, but look at some of the underlying issues that uh, have, have affected the economic and social fabric of this country. So it's trying to build resilience within Nigeria, build uh, the, the economy, the, uh, look at uh, different areas that uh, the United Nations can support Nigeria on. The economic downturn, which is a, an international phenomenon, which is directly impacting uh, Nigeria, especially with the oil prices and, and so on. 105 million people are now um, in, under the, in, in poverty. And it's looking at, say for example, UNDP, at, at the economic situation and how we can support Nigeria better. Um, other organizations around food, FAO, around health, WHO and UNICEF, uh, and so on and so forth, to try and build the resilience to be able to recover uh, in, in the end. And how is the UN helping Nigeria recover from COVID-19? Well, it, it, it's, it's very much that. The first and foremost is, is addressing the pandemic, uh, working with the presidential task force uh, and, and now the, the uh, uh, ministries as well to try and ensure that at uh, state level, at LGA level, and at ward level, people understand the dynamic of the uh, COVID-19 uh, um, problem um, and trying to look at and understand what they can do. So wearing masks, uh, socially distancing, uh, and washing of hands. And at state level, there's a lot that's being done by the United Nations with the relevant state authorities, with traditional leaders, with um, the, the religious leaders to and for the communities to understand that. Secondly, there's the vaccine, which is uh, one thing, and, and we'll come back to that later, I'm sure, uh, but also uh, the social fabric. One of the problems with uh, a situation of this kind is gender-based violence is on the increase uh, in, in inside the communities. So making gender-based violence uh, 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 an issue of emergency in the country, which His Excellency uh, President Buhari was able to do, and now it's replicated at state level, has ensured that any attack on young girls uh, in the house or within the community will be looked at and will uh, be, be taken to the uh, proper uh, jurisdiction and the girls protected and helped in their own way.
My conversation with Mr. Hawkins gives news after the break. You'll stay with us. Your work incidentally involves children. How do you think they have been impacted by COVID-19 in Nigeria? Ch children have, as always, whether it's conflict or a, or a, a virus of this nature, uh, the unintended consequences are very severe on children. Uh, yes, they do not uh, are not as prone to the problems that the virus brings as indeed adults are, but they're nonetheless the indirect consequences. One, the, the social impact of uh, um, the COVID-19 in, in, in terms of how people have to uh, change their social norms directly impacts on children. The closure of schools and the fact that continuous learning became a problem. Uh, Gender-based violence is an impact on young girls at the worst. Um, a, a teenage girl who is preg pregnant and usually not f for their own making is unable to return to school. The poverty directly impacts children in the most extreme way. How many children have returned to school since, since the lockdown, since the closure of, of uh, uh, the schools? Have the same number of returned uh, as were at school before? I, I, I doubt it. Um, and we'll see those figures coming through to the fore soon. And some countries around the world are already administering COVID vaccines to children or are considering giving COVID vaccines to children. Do you think Nigeria should follow suit? Nigeria has done very well in how it is administering uh, vaccines. It has chosen to do it for 18 and above uh, and, and stick to the priority areas. That, that is the correct course of action given the number of vaccines that have been brought into Nigeria, given the number of places and outlets that Nigeria has to be able to administer vaccines. Uh, roughly 100,000 uh, doses of vaccines are administered every day. That is a considerable amount. Uh, it does need to increase. Uh, the number of vaccines coming in is, allows uh, that uh, uh, increase to take place. Uh, but sticking to 18 and above at this stage is probably the mo mo most sensible uh, way of, of uh, undertaking uh, the management of vaccine, the management of the virus uh, going forward. That is the priority area. I'd like to stay with vaccines, uh, if you don't mind. There's still just a very small percentage of uh, countries in Africa that have vaccinated at least 60% of their populations. What do you think is the main problem here? Vaccine availability or acquisition? It, 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 it's both, and, and the two are, are, are mutually supportive of each other. The availability of vaccine has been a real problem, um, but the equation is beginning to change now. Uh, and say, for example, Nigeria received the first 4 million vaccines on the 2nd of March, and then it was a long time before it received the second uh, shipment of vaccines. But now the shipments of vaccines are coming in at a more regular rate um, and increasing substantially uh, uh, bit by bit. Over the next few months, uh, Nigeria should receive sufficient number of vaccines uh, to shift the problem to will we be able to use them all uh, effectively. I think we will. Um, the, the uptake is good, but we need to look at different ways of ensuring that uptake, uh, the daily uptake is, is uh, increased. But, the, but it's taken a long time for the international community, the donor governments, uh, to be able to shift from uh, thinking purely about themselves to thinking about countries like Nigeria with the, with the, with the vaccines. But uh, that shift has taken place. And now uh, we're on the road to uh, ensuring that there are sufficient vaccines in country to be able to, under uh, to address the problem. I do understand that all the attention is now fixed on the recovery from COVID-19. But there are other health and social challenges facing children that's getting lost in the conversation is in there. For example, Sunday is World Polio Day and UNICEF is encouraging families to continue to immunize their children against the disease, despite Nigeria having eradicated polio. Absolutely. The, the, 2,350 children die a day in Nigeria under the age of five. There are a whole myriad of, of diseases, respiratory diseases, um, diarrhea, um, vaccine-preventable diseases, um, and, and so on and so forth. 
uh, and we must find that balance. The COVID is a serious global pandemic. Nigeria has, it will not be out of that pandemic until it has been able to vaccinate sufficient number of people within, uh, within Nigeria. But at the same time, we must see the, a balanced way of uh, using the limited resources that Nigeria has, especially the human resources, to be able to uh, ensure that uh, Penta 3, measles, uh, as you've said, uh, you know, polio is a good example. While polio has been eradicated, but routine immunization, which has uh, polio as part of it, needs to be increased to stop uh, the children from, from, from dying or, or getting um, uh, paralyzed uh, uh, as, 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 it, as it goes along. Um, we are looking at that. The Ministry of Health, the MPHCDA, and state governments are trying very hard to ensure that they can respond to both the pandemic, but also to other preventable diseases uh, that would safeguard the lives of women and children. Finally, Peter, what has UNICEF said about the kidnap of school children that was quite rampant this year in Nigeria? We, we have been very concerned at the rates of uh, kidnappings and uh, banditry against uh, schools that have taken place uh, during the course of this year. 1,341 children have, uh, since the 9th of December, been kidnapped uh, in, in Nigeria, 17 teachers. Uh, this has not only had an enormous impact on those children alone, but has also had an impact on education as a whole, as parents are nervous about sending their children to school, children themselves are nervous about going to school, teachers are nervous about going to school. And until the security situation has, has improved, uh, many schools, especially in states like Zamfara or Kaduna, have actually closed down. I think that there is a conference that will be held next week, an international conference on safe schools, um, which will be opened by His Excellency President Buhari. Um, Abuja was chosen to be uh, um, host as Nigeria it welcomes the world to come and discuss this very issue. It's a global issue, an issue that the world is grappling with as children's education is being interrupted both by insecurity but also by um, schools being used by uh, different military groups uh, ar around the world. Here in Nigeria, as I said, um, there's been a lot of attention on this very subject and Nigeria will share its experience uh, with, with the rest of the world during this conference. There are three areas that uh, need to be addressed. One is the sharing of intelligence and understanding of how and what uh, the um, insecurity is about. Is it insurgency uh, or ideology, which is addressed in, in a certain way? Is it a conflict between communities? Or is it banditry, as, as you've said, i.e. extortion? Um, each one needs a different type of, of response. Secondly, each state needs an educational security plan to be able to ensure that uh, they can mitigate against the risks and respond should uh, a situation arise. But I think the most important, and this is where UNICEF has worked very closely hand in hand with the state governments, is the relationship between the school and the communities, that the communities value the learning that the schools have to offer and therefore protect uh, those schools. Schools-based management committees are a critical part of any school and they can uh, expand their, their influence into the communities, bring parents into the school to see how valuable education is, how valuable learning is, and therefore protect uh, school. The United Nations is very much part of all of this and very much part of the Safe School Declaration, which will be um, reinforced during the course of next week here in Abuja. Thanks again, Peter Hawkins, for speaking with me on Diplomatic Channel. You're very welcome and thank you very much and happy UN Day. This is where we end the program this week. Don't forget you can watch previous editions again on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com slash channels web. Look through the playlist for Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time. <laughs>